Download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources at savantwealth.com slash guides. Okay, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to today's live Savant webinar. We're very happy that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to join us and be with us today. My name is Jack Phelps, and I'm a financial advisor and the managing director of our Boston office, which is located just west of the city in the town of Wellesley. For over 35 years, as incredible as that is for me to even admit that, I've had the privilege of helping a lot of really terrific individuals and couples prepare for and navigate their complex retirement transition. And I'm as excited today as at any other point in my career because of all the tools and the resources that we now have available to us. So today we're gonna to discuss important birthdays for you to remember for a successful retirement experience. These important birthdays are so important for you. And so we've created a, a timeline for you to use sort of as a checklist to make important decisions so that you can avoid common mistakes that are so common out there and take advantage of potential opportunities that are available to you. And at the same time, make smart, intelligent decisions that can give you a better opportunity to realize the ideal future that you've prepared for. So if you've been a dedicated saver during your lifetime, I strongly recommend spending time with us for the remainder of this retirement seminar. If you have questions, we strongly recommend asking those. You can do so at the chat box at the bottom of your screen. At the end of my presentation today, we're gonna to leave ourselves some time to be available to answer any questions that you may have, and we strongly encourage you to do so. Why don't we jump right into these important birthdays? And forgive me, I'm just going to share my screen. So there are there are eight important birthdays that we're going to cover here today. And as you can tell, it, it it stretches across a very wide swath of time from your 50th birthday all the way down to your 73rd birthday. And we're going to spend a good chunk of time with each one of these. And we're going to talk about all those opportunities that you may have to be able to make really smart, educated decisions. So let's jump right in with our first one which is your 50th birthday. So if you haven't done a great job of saving up until now, and you've got some catch up to do to make up for, once you reach the age of 50, you have the opportunity to contribute more money to your company's retirement plan, whether that be a 401k or a 403b or a 457 or a TSP if you happen to work for the federal government. So up until now, once you reach before the age of 50, you can contribute $23,000 a year to your plan. Once you reach the age of 50, however, you can then increase your contribution to another $7,500 per year for a total of $30,500 per year. And then something that's coming up beginning in 2025, thanks to Secure Act 2.0, for those once you reach the age of 60, between 60 and 63, you can increase those contributions up to $10,000 per year. And these also apply to your IRAs as well. So up until 50, you can contribute $7,000 to a Roth or a traditional IRA. Once you reach age 50, you can increase those contributions another $1,000 a year up to $8,000 a year. So you certainly wanna be taking advantage of that at every opportunity. All right, let's jump over to your 55th birthday and let's talk about this thing called the rule of 55. So where does this come into play? So if you are over the age of 55, but you're not yet 59 and a half, and you would like to be able to withdraw funds from your retirement plan for one of two reasons. One of them is you retire early, or the second one is you separate from your job and you have a gap of income, which requires that you need some income coming in and you want to draw from your company's retirement plan. The challenge that most folks run into prior to age 59 and a half is that the IRS has set it up to discourage you from taking money out of your plan. So they've given you the opportunity to save on a pre-tax basis up until now. However, they discourage you by taking money out of the plan because they impose a 10% penalty on your withdrawals in addition to the taxes that you have to pay. So where the opportunity comes in with respect to the rule of 55 is that once you reach age 55, between 55 and, and 59 and a half, you now can take money from your company's retirement plan and you can do that without the 10% penalty. 
The critical distinction here, though, is this only applies to the plan which, with which you're participating in right now or the plan for the company that you just left. So if you have worked many different employers over the years and you have accumulated a lot of 401k plans or 403b plans, like so many folks are that we have met, it's only the most current plan that you have been involved in that you can take advantage of this. The key, the key here is that the rule of 55 does not automatically apply. Your employer has to put it into their summary plan description. So you wanna be checking with your employer to make sure that that's available to you. So if you're gonna retire prior to the age of 59 and a half, the last thing you wanna do is have to pay a 10% penalty to touch your money that you've spent so much time carefully saving. So if you're under the age of 55, the place to go without paying any penalties whatsoever is anything that's in a taxable non-IRA brokerage account or your savings account. So you can't touch an IRA prior to that without a 10% penalty. Once you've reached age 55, between 55 and 59 and a half, then you can exercise this rule of 55 and access funds without a 10% penalty. And then once you reach age 59 and a half, then the lid comes off, as we're going to talk about in just a moment, you can access all your IRAs, 401ks, 403bs without having to pay a 10% penalty. Which now brings us to age 59 and a half, which is the next important birthday. This is a biggie because this is the time that you can now access your funds inside of your retirement plans, whether it be an IRA or your 403b or your 401k, and you can do so without any 10% 10, any 10 penalty. The other situation that we see that comes up for folks where a big opportunity lies for you is if you're still working and a large percentage of your investments are inside of your employer's retirement plan, but let's say that the investment options within your employer's plan are not exactly optimal for your current needs. So if a large percentage of your savings is in the plan, let's say that 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of your entire savings is in your company's retirement plan because you've been with the employer for a long time. If their investment options are not, are not exactly suitable for you or optimal at this time in your life, you can exercise what is known as an in-service withdrawal and you can roll some or all of the balances of your employer's plan directly over to your IRA without incurring a 10% penalty or without incurring any income taxes. So just to be clear here, we're not talking about the money that you contribute to your retirement plan. We still suggest that you continue contributing to your employer's retirement plan, taking advantage of all the company matches that you possibly can. What we're referring to are the balances that are in your plan. Once you reach age 59 and a half, you are no longer captive inside of your company's retirement plan. You have the opportunity to take money from there, part of it or all of it, and move it to your own individual IRA. And that opens up your investment world to unlimited options. Okay, now let's jump over to age 62, which in my opinion, as you're gonna find out here, is probably the most important one. There's a lot of opportunities that come up. The biggest one being, this is the earliest age that you can qualify for, for social security. The other thing that we find very, very common at age 62 is age 62 is the age where we see most folks run into what we refer to as the paycheck dependency threshold. So what does that mean? Well, the paycheck dependency threshold is after you have been working for many, many years, usually 20, 30, 40 years, where you sort of pause and you reflect and you sort of begin to wonder, gee, I wonder if I have built up enough to be able to afford to stop working if I choose to, yet still live the exact lifestyle that I want without a paycheck anymore. Very, very common at this age for folks to reach that point. Unfortunately, far too many people that we have run into over all these years that I've been doing this fall into one of two categories. The first one is you work longer than you need to because you feel you have to, when in fact you may very well not have to. Uh, if you actually calculated and ran your numbers, it's certainly possible you want to be certain that you don't need to anymore, and that only comes with proper planning. The flip side of that equation is the opposite. You retire, but you sort of pull your punches and you spend less than you can afford to, likely out of fear that you're going to run out of money, which is completely understandable. That's one of the most common fears that we see people have. The challenge with that, though, is you then potentially miss out on the ideal future that you could be experiencing with proper planning. And so this is not a position that you want to be that you want to find yourself in. And so our recommendation, if you have reached this stage in your life, is to spend a lot of time 
finding your individual answers to three very, very important questions at this phase in your life. So let's take a moment to walk through those. The first question is, over and above what you're going to receive from Social Security, from a pension or pensions if you happen to qualify for pensions, and rental property, if you have rental property income, you want to factor that into the equation as well. Over and above those three income sources, how much will you need to withdraw from your retirement bucket of investments each year to support your desired lifestyle? One of the questions that is the most common is, have we built up enough? Do we have enough? Well, two couples, if you think about this, who have the same level of investment savings, they have the same level of income, but one of them, let's say couple, couple A, needs to withdraw $5,000 per month to support their desired lifestyle, and couple B needs to withdraw $10,000 a month from the same size retirement bucket, you need to know the answer of those two because that's going to be a big, big answer to finding out just how financially healthy you are at this stage in your life. So let's assume just for a moment that you've done your homework and you have figured out the answer to that. Once you figure that out, then the next question is, what long-term investment rate of return do, do you need to earn in order for your investments to generate the inflation-fighting cash flow that you need each year and remain intact for the rest of your life? So going back to my example I just gave you there, if, if, a, if two couples have the same amount of investment savings, yet couple A needs to withdraw $5,000 a month to support their lifestyle, couple B needs to withdraw $10,000 to support their lifestyle, in order for their money to last for the rest of their lives, couple B is going to have to earn a much better rate of return on their money to generate the necessary cash flow to kick off $10,000 a month than couple A generating only $5,000 a month. This is why knowing the, the investment rate of return is so critically important. Over all these years in doing this, I've yet to meet one couple who had the answer to this question prior to going through this process. And I can't, I, I can't overemphasize how important it is. Let's now say that you've calculated the answer to both of those questions. Your next question then is, what investment system should you implement to help you potentially earn the inflation-fighting returns that you need to earn? I can't overemphasize over how important I believe it is for you to spend a lot of time with these three questions and finding out what your answers are to them. Part of finding out the answer to those are the next two topics here at age 62, which is, Social Security, because you have the opportunity to start taking benefits when you're 62 versus waiting until your full retirement age or age 70. And you also have to be thinking about health insurance, which is a big, big factor that, that stops a lot of people in their tracks. Because prior to age 65, when you qualify for Medicare, which we're going to touch on in a moment, you have to support yourself with your own health insurance. So let's jump in and let's talk about Social Security first. And Social Security is one of those hot topics that we hear and we receive questions on this on related to Social Security as, as much as any other topic. And there's a lot of sort of controversy out there and there's a lot of people who are making a lot of assumptions out there in terms of what you should do. I think it's easy for everybody to make an assumption that you should just delay your benefits all the way to age 67 or age 70 because you're going to receive a higher benefit. However, in our, in our experience, after calculating this and going through this transition with so many clients over the year, we think that's short-sighted and we think there are a lot of other factors that you, that you should be considering. So let's take a second to walk through all of these considerations. And I strongly recommend you give some serious thought to these and where, where they might apply to you. The first one is your health and your life expectancy. So if you have very strong feelings about your life expectancy, that you're going to live a long time, your parents lived a long time, uh, and your future is bright, that's one thing. However, you have to take your health into consideration. We run into folks all the time who don't feel quite as strongly about their life expectancy uh, due to many factors, their own individual health, their mom, their father, when they passed away, what they've been subject to. Depending on how strongly you feel about your life expectancy, that's going to dictate how soon you want to begin taking your Social Security benefits. The second thing you want to be considering is your level of investment assets and specifically the percentage of those investment assets that are not in IRAs and 401ks versus those that are in IRAs and 401ks and thus subject to income taxes when you pull money out. The higher your level of investment assets, the less dependent you are on Social Security as a retirement income source. So that has to play into your level of thinking. 
correlates to that is the concept of spending versus preserving your assets. You have to remember that every year that you delay taking Social Security, what you're telling Social Security is keep your money. I'm going to spend my own money. So if I choose to take if I choose to retire at age 62, but yet I'm going to wait till 70 to start take claiming my Social Security benefits, that means I have to spend my own assets right now in order to fill the income gap. That has to be a really serious consideration. The fourth one that I think you have to spend some time with is one that I don't hear talked about quite as much, uh, but we spend a lot of time talking to our clients because we think it is real and that's political risk. And so what I mean by this, it's not exactly a big secret that the Social Security Trust Fund is not exactly as healthy as it should be. And all the indications now, all the predictions are that the Social Security Trust Fund is going to have a problem at about 2034, which is less than 10 years away. And when that happens, they're going to have to make some pretty significant cuts. So in order to make the Social Security Trust Fund viable, you have to start thinking about politically, what are their options available to them in order to do that? Well, one of those could be to reduce benefits for those who are already receiving benefits. And I'm not sure that any politician is going to sign up for that because they'd be voted out of office the next day. <laughs> the next thing that, could, that they could do is they could choose to increase payroll taxes for all of us who are still working today. That certainly is on the table. However, not very politically popular. Another thing that they could do is something they've already done, which is extend out the age at which you can start receiving benefits. It used to be that your full retirement age was age 65 back when I got in the business in 1989. Today, it's as high as 67. The other one that is less talked about is means testing. So what is means testing? Means testing is when they put a qualifier on there based on your level of income and your assets to determine how much you should be receiving in Social Security benefits or the cost of living raise that you may receive. And that is in their toolbox as well, because they've already exercised this, as we'll discuss in a moment with respect to Medicare. There are some folks who pay a certain amount for their Medicare benefits, and there are others who pay more than three times what the minimum is. And that's all based on what their income is. So they've already done this with Medicare. They also did it with, with Social Security back in the early 1990s when they made more of your Social Security benefits subject to income taxes. So again, political risk is something you have to assess, and depending on how strongly you feel about the federal government's ability to manage the Social Security Trust Fund and what their options are and how much money you've accumulated, you have to really consider that in our opinion. The next factor that you want to be considering are cost of living adjustments, because as soon as you begin receiving your Social Security benefits, your cost of living adjustments begin. So for, for example, in January of 2025, coming up in just a few short months, everybody who was already receiving Social Security is going to receive an automatic 2.5% 2, 2 raise. So the earlier you start your benefits, the earlier you start your cost of living raises. The next one to consider, which is very important, are spousal benefits. And specifically what I'm speaking about here are spouses who did not earn as much as their other spouse. So here's the way Social Security works. If one spouse in the relationship stays until their full retirement age, and let's say they're going to collect $3,000 per month. If the other spouse either never worked a day in their life or didn't earn very much, that other spouse is going gonna, is gonna to be able to receive and collect half of what their other spouse is making when they go to claim at full retirement age. So for example, if at full retirement age, your spouse is going to collect $3,000 per month, even if the other spouse never worked a day in their life, they're going to begin collecting $1,500 per month at full retirement age. Combined, that would be $4,500 per month. So the longer that you work, the higher your spouse's spousal benefit is going to be and your collective benefit is going to be. That has to be a factor as well. Survivor benefits sort of tie into the same equation. The way survivor benefits work is if one spouse passes away, their surviving spouse keeps the higher of the two benefits. So the longer you wait to collect your benefits, the higher your benefits are going to be and the higher your benefits will be for your surviving spouse. And then the last consideration that, I, that I'm going to strongly recommend you spend some time with is if you're going to retire at 62 or maybe work part time, Social Security imposes an earnings limit. And that earnings limit is on earned income as opposed to unearned. And here's the distinction. Earned income is from work, from business. Earned income, though, is not dividends, capital gains, interest you may earn, uh, and things of that nature. 
So once you reach age 66 or 67, we're going to talk about what your full retirement age in just a moment. Once you reach that age, you, you're entitled to your full retirement benefit and you have no limitations whatsoever on how much you can earn outside of Social Security. However, beginning in 2025, you can collect Social Security at the age of 62. However, you can only earn $1,950 per month or $23,400 per month from work and still collect your full Social Security benefits that you're entitled to. Once you go over that limit, for every $2 that you earn above the limit, Social Security withholds a dollar in benefits. So just an easy example, if you earn $35,400 in a given year once you're over the age of 62, that's $12,000 over the limit. That means that Social Security is going to withhold half of that, which is $6,000 or $500 per month. So this has to influence whether you're going to begin collecting as well. It's another factor in there. The other big factor that you have to be thinking about in addition to Social Security, which I strongly recommend taking a lot of time to think about all of those factors, as you can see, it's not just an easy decision. The other big decision, which really keeps people stuck in their tracks, is the cost of health insurance. Uh, prior to age 65, you're not entitled to Medicare, which is government's plan, and you have to be thinking about what, how are you going to fill that gap. So here are six options that you can think of to be able to help you prior to the age of 65. The first one is COBRA. COBRA is your employer's health insurance plan that you're entitled to receive. If you leave your employer prior to the age of 65, you can jump on their, on their COBRA plan. You will have to pay for it, as we're going to talk about in just a moment, but they do have to offer that plan, and you can jump on that plan. If your spouse or your partner has health insurance, you can jump on your, your spouse's plan. That's another option. Another option that's been around for less than 10 years now, but it's very viable, is the ACA health insurance uh, exchange. And if you do that, there's also a potential opportunity for premium tax credits. And there's some planning that goes along with that based on your other income. And if you're subject to this and you have this available to you, you want to be going to healthcare.gov or your state's healthcare exchange for more information. Another place to go for health insurance is your union healthcare. If you happen to work for a union, unions have healthcare for retirees. Another spot to go is part-time job. There are a lot of jobs that will offer you part-time work. And as long as you have a minimum number of hours, they will include you on their employer-sponsored health insurance plan. And then finally, there's health insurance, or excuse me, health savings accounts. If you contributed to a health savings account during your working years and you built that up, you can now use that to fill the gap between 62 and 65. So in terms of costs, let's take a look at those. If you join COBRA afterward, and that's going to be your solution, you can anticipate the costs being between $400 and $700 per month per person. If you say, no, I'm going to go, to, uh, I don't like my company's plan very much. I'm going to go into the private market, uh, in private marketplace insurance. If you're, in, if you're in your 50s, the average right now is $655 per month. And if you're in your 60s, it's $994 per month. So don't forget, if you're if it's a couple, that's roughly $2,000 per month that you're going to have to fill that gap. The big distinction here that you have to remember is that while you're working, the average employer covers 78% of your health insurance costs, and the average employee pays 22. Once you then sever employment, you now have to cover 100%. My other caveat that I want to throw in about health insurance is I see health insurance stopping everybody in their tracks. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. And the reason I say that is because every time that we run the numbers and we take a look at where it fits into everybody's plan, they come back and so many of them say, well, gee, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I think there's a lot of scare tactics going on out there. So I would take some significant time to calculate exactly what your insurance options are. If you're really giving serious consideration to retiring before 65, map this out. It's not undoable. It is, it is absolutely possible. Okay, let's switch gears now and let's uh, let's jump over to your to uh, to your 65th birthday, and this is where Medicare kicks in. So when you're eligible for for Medicare, which is at age 65, the enrollment period for that, if you're not working, is three months before until three months after you reach age 65, the month in which you reach age 65. If you continue to work, you do not need to enroll in Medicare right away. And when you do stop working, let's say you work until 68. That is what is known as a qualifying event. And during that qualifying event, you then have time, you have a window uh, once you reach that age or you separate from service that you can sign up for Medicare at that time. And when you do that, 
prior to, to doing that, you want to be doing your homework on getting a supplemental insurance plan, which is also called a Medigap plan. And the reason why you want to do this is because Medicare covers 80% of your insurance costs, the other 20% you are liable for. So you want to figure out the most cost-effective plan for you, given your health history, given where you plan to live, and also given the amount of, of prescription drugs that you take. There are a lot of different plans that are out there right now. Of course, Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the biggest, but there are a lot of different plans that are out there, depending on the state that you live in. You want to spend some significant time finding out what those are. And then finally, the last piece with respect to Medicare is to watch out for IRMA. So IRMA is what we refer to as a hidden tax. And I referred to this a little bit earlier, but here's the way this works. When you sign up for Medicare and specifically Medicare Part B, there's a premium that comes along with that. And the minimum premium that everybody pays in calendar year 2024 is just a tick under $175 per month. However, the amount of premium that you pay is, 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 is predicated based on the amount of income at the bottom of your income tax return two years prior. So everybody who started collecting benefits or whoever is collecting benefits uh, from Part B in 2024, their income tax return in 2022 dictates how much they pay in Medicare premiums. So as you can see here, there are some couples who pay more than three times the amount for the same Medicare coverage as others. And this requires some significant planning. So if you have changed jobs or if you fully retired and you had a stock buyout plan at the end of that, or you did some Roth conversions, this is another example where people are going to do some great planning and they're lowering their, their tax bracket in future years by converting money from a traditional IRA over to a Roth. That's a great strategy. However, there's a consequence to that. And the consequence to doing that is it increases your taxable income, which could increase your Medicare Part B premium. So anytime that you're going to be making decisions with respect to Roth conversions or any other taxable strategy and where your income is going to be derived from, you have to also give consideration to this hidden tax so that you don't pay any more than you want to. You want to figure out what your brackets are, not just for income taxes, but also for your Medicare premiums. Okay, now let's uh, let's flip over to your 66th or your 67th birthday. And the reason why there's two is because your Social Security benefits, as I mentioned earlier, back when I first got into this business back in 1989, <laughs> incredible to admit that, uh, everybody's full retirement age was 65. Today, however, depending on when your birthday is, if you were born between the ages of between 1943 and 1959, full retirement age for you is age 66. Everybody born after 1960, then it's age 67. So here's the way this works. And this is a very generic answer, uh, a very, gen very generic example. Let's say that your, your full retirement age is age 66 and that your benefit is $1,000 per month. It's highly likely, by the way, if you're on this call right now, that the benefit is going to be significantly higher than that, but you can, you can multiply that out. But if your benefit was $1,000 per month, and you chose to receive it at 62, your benefit would then be 750 a month. However, if you waited until age 70, it would be 1320 a month. So you can see where the dilemma is. It's tempting to wait. However, before you do that, strongly recommend that you spend some time with all those factors that we talked about a little bit earlier and weigh them because everybody's situation is different. And then before you go to claim, there are, there are four other things that you want to be paying attention to. The first one we touched on a little bit earlier, and that is if you claim benefits before your full retirement age, which is either 66 or 67, Social Security puts an earnings limit on the amount of money that you can earn. So if you, if you, have, a, if you have intentions of working part-time, you want to strongly consider waiting if you're working part-time, depending on how much you make. The second thing to pay attention to is what's known as the windfall elimination provision. Just went through this with, with a couple yesterday for the first time. She's a teacher, has been teaching for 31 years in the state of Massachusetts. Teachers in Massachusetts don't contribute to Social Security. So because of that, even if they have 40 quarters built up and they're, and they're entitled to receive Social Security benefits, they will not receive Social Security benefits. It gets, it gets eliminated through this windfall elimination windfall elimination provision, or it's drastically reduced. So if you, if one spouse in, in a couple or both are subject to uh, Social Security and they've been contributing to Social Security, but you've also been employed as a teacher or certain government employees where 
you're not contributing to Social Security, you want to be visiting with your Social Security office and spend some time to find out how much the windfall elimination provision affects you. Touched on a little bit earlier, uh, but in addition to having the privilege of contributing a lot of your paycheck over the years to Social Security when you turn around to receive benefits, you also have the privilege of, in, in most cases, of paying taxes on, that, on, on your benefits. And the way it works is if, if you don't have any other taxable income in your life, Social Security is your only income, none of that is subject to income taxes. However, the more income that you have in addition to Social Security, in addition to the taxes you pay on that increased income, that also makes more of your Social Security income subject to income taxes. So when you're strategizing and you're planning about where your income is going to be drawn from, remember the more income that you realize in a given year through a Roth conversion or through realizing a capital gain, that very, very possibly could be increasing the taxable benefits or increasing the amount of your Social Security benefits that are subject to income taxes. If you are subject to taxes on your Social Security, then you can have them withhold. And when you go to file, you'll find out that they can withhold anywhere from 7 to 20 percent, 22 percent of your federal um, taxes. And then finally, there's Medicare. When you go to apply for Social Security, if it is, uh, once you're 65, you can also apply at the same time. So if you retire right on the, on the nose, right at 65, and you sign up for Social Security, you will automatically be enrolled in, in, in Medicare at that time. And your Medicare premiums can then be withheld directly from your Social Security benefits. If not, then you're going to have to pay the premiums outside by writing a check each month or having it directly drafted from your, from your checking account, which is what most folks do. Okay, let, now let's jump over to the next birthday, which is your age 70 and a half. And at age 70 and a half, you may recall back in what I would call the old days, at age 70 and a half used to be the year that you had to begin taking your required minimum distribution from your IRA. That thankfully has been pushed out. And now the age at which you have to start taking money out of your IRA has been pushed out to age 73. It went to 72, 73, as we'll touch on in a minute. Now it's up to 75 for those born after 2032. However, there's a great benefit that is available to you in order to be able to take advantage of deducting and getting a tax benefit from making charitable, distri from making charitable distributions or contributions to your favorite charity. So if you have an IRA, if you are 70 and a half or older, and you'd like to make a gift to a charitable organization of $100,000 or less, you can make that contribution directly from your IRA. And it does not matter whether you are itemizing your deductions or, or, you're, or you're filing with a standard deduction. This is an issue that we find a lot of people run into today. They have charitable intents. They give away money with a check. However, they're subject to the standard deduction, not itemized, so they're not receiving any benefits whatsoever on a tax basis for contributing to the charity. Nowadays, you can, you can begin to withdraw money from your IRA each year. So if you contribute $5,000 from your IRA starting at 870 to a charity, that means that's $5,000 that you're not paying taxes on. So once you start taking your required minimum distribution, say at age 73, for example, if your required distribution was seven, was $50,000 and you contributed $5,000 to a charity directly, you're only taxed on $45,000. So you receive the full tax benefit. The strategic byproduct of that is that by having your income reduced from 50 to 45, you also increase the likelihood that your Medicare surtax that we just talked about a minute ago is also going to be less. So you can combine the two strategies. You can make distributions directly to your favorite charities from your IRA and also potentially decrease your Medicare premiums. Strongly recommend spending some time thinking about this and, and, and strategizing all the options that you have available to you. Okay, the, the last birthday we're going to touch on is your 73rd birthday. We just talked about this, but there's two points that we want to bring up. One of them is your required distribution, uh, which you have to start taking now at the age of 73. And then the second part is Secure Act 2.0, which has now changed the rules a little bit. So let's talk about that. First of all, is everybody, if you have contributed to an IRA, a 401k, a 403b, or 457, everyone, once they reach the age of 73 now, must start taking money out of your IRA at that age and, of course, paying the tax on this. 
So if you think about it, the IRS has allowed you to defer the taxes on that all this time, now they want to start receiving some of those tax dollars. So you have to start taking money out when you're 73 years old. I mentioned earlier, but if, you're turn, if you turn 74 after December 31st in 2032, then your required minimum distribution age has been pushed out to age 75. In addition to paying taxes on all the distributions that you have to take out, which is what they're after, if you fail to take your required minimum distribution, there's a penalty involved. That penalty used to be $50,000. Today, it's now been reduced to 25, excuse me, to 50%. Now it's reduced down to 25%. So going back to our example, if your required minimum distribution was $50,000 and you failed to take that in the old days, you would have to pay a 25% penalty, excuse me, a 50% penalty or $25,000. Today though, it's been reduced to 25%, which is still no picnic. You'd give up $12,500 if, if you fail to take your distribution. Pay careful attention to this. An opportunity that you have to be able to reduce, potentially reduce your required distributions when you get to be 73 or 75 is to start taking a look at converting some of your traditional IRAs and 401ks over to Roth IRAs from the age of 62 all the way through age 73 or 75. By doing that, you've pulled money out of your traditional IRA, pay tax on those, hopefully at a lower tax rate. And then by doing so, less money is in your IRA and subject to the required distribution when you turn 75. Critically important planning point that you want to spend time with. The other factor that we want to touch on here, which is very, very important, is the SECURE Act also changed a very important rule for non-spouse beneficiaries. So what we mean by that is a non-spouse beneficiary is everybody other than your spouse. That could be a brother, a sister, son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson, niece, nephew, anybody other than your spouse, if they inherit your IRA, back in the what I would call the old days, they were able to, to transfer that money over to an inherited IRA and stretch their required distributions over their lifetime. So if they were 40 years old and they had a life expectancy of 40 or 50 years, they could stretch their tax burden over those 40 or 50 years. However, today with, with the SECURE Act, they now have to take everything out and that account has to be emptied within 10 years. Now that's the bad news. The good news though, though, is that there are some planning opportunities that you have within there. And what I mean by that is they don't necessarily make, I'm gonna make this distinction in a little bit. They don't necessarily make you take out the same amount every year. You can wait and take it out in the most strategic time available to you. And of course you wanna be taking advantage of that as much as possible. All right, so as I, as I mentioned earlier uh, here, what we have done here is that we have created this important birthdays timeline for you. And we did that so that you could have a checklist of all of these important dates and what I refer to as these important inflection points to make important decisions. And so we strongly recommend that you take some time to be thinking about each one of these and all the different periods of time that are involved and where you could be taking advantage of that for yourself. Because there's no sense saving all this money if it's not available to you when, when you'd like it to be available. So, and what we strongly recommend is taking the time to assess your own current situation at this period of time. We've covered a lot of different topics here today and a lot of them could be, uh, could be pertinent to you and valuable to you, some of them will not. What I would recommend you do as a result of everything that we learned here today is to, is to sort of take stock of your own current situation and think about which one of these areas that you see in front of you here add to your financial security and which one of them make you feel more, more vulnerable. And then spend some significant time prioritizing what those are. And then if you feel as though you'd like to start a conversation with us, reach out to us. We are here to be able to answer, certainly answer your questions. Okay, so why don't we now jump over to questions. And uh, I see that we have, geez, we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just sort through for just a moment. Yeah, we have a lot of questions here and I'm gonna answer as many as I can. And uh, so the first one that we're gonna to touch on is, um, let me read this, is social security. I thought waiting to collect my social security benefits at age 70 was best. 
can you expand on what you said about spending my investments? Okay, great question. So as I, as I touched on earlier, the decision to begin your benefits early versus waiting until age 70 uh, is a big topic right now, but there are a lot of different factors that are that, that, that you need to be considering. It's not a matter of my benefits are greater at the age 70 than they are today. You have to really think about those other ones. And the thing to think about is this, to touch on and to answer that question specifically. The longer that you wait to collect benefits, what you're telling Social Security is keep your, benef keep your benefits. I don't want them now. I'm going to spend my own money. So what I mean by spending your own money is you have a certain level of money in your retirement bucket of investments. If you delay your benefits, you have to spend those benefits. So when you spend those benefits, a couple of things to think about. Number one, those benefits, then the amount of money that you have in your retirement bucket doesn't grow as fast, right? So you have less. The second part of that is that you forego the earnings on that going forward, right? The math is, and again, you're gonna to need to calculate this for yourselves or, or, or we're happy to calculate it for you. Every year that you delay benefits, you have to live anywhere between 12 and 14 years in order for to break even. And that doesn't take into consideration any lost earnings on the money that you had to spend while you delayed. So that's what we mean about delaying benefits and, and the cost of that and having to spend your own benefits. The other factor which is, isn't thought about as much is the more of your benefits that you spend, that's less that's gonna get passed on to your family. Social security benefits do not continue on to anybody other than your spouse. They don't continue to your kids or anybody else. So that means if you've chosen to delay your benefits and spend down your own assets, that means that you have less assets with which to pass on to your family. So this is one example where I really believe that critical planning is really important. I would really give some, some significant thought to all those factors that we touched on earlier, uh, but this is a really important one. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, bear with me just a moment. Uh, and, and this one was on inherited IRAs. Can you clarify the new 10-year requirement? Yes. So going back to just to clarify what we mean by this, this applies to non-spouse beneficiaries. So money going to your spouse, spouses and spouses only can transfer money from their IRA to your deceased, from, from a deceased spouse's IRA over to your IRA with no tax consequences whatsoever. However, if it goes to a non-spouse beneficiary, brother, sister, daughter, uh, son, granddaughter, grandson, et cetera, then these rules kick in. And there's two, there's two important points. Number one is that money then has to be drawn out and the account had the inherited IRA has to be emptied within 10 years of the date of death of the year that the, that the decedent passes away. That means you have 10 years with, with, with which to plan how much you want to take out. It all doesn't have to come out equally, but you've got 10 years and then it's got to be emptied. The other new clarification that just came out within the last couple of months was this. If, if the decedent who owned the IRA prior to this had money and they were beginning to take their required minimum distribution, let's say they were 73, if they had already started, that means you have to continue taking that same required minimum distribution equally over, over a 10 year period. So your flexibility and your ability to plan is a little bit less. Again, you wanna, you wanna make some decisions based on if they were taking their required minimum distribution or not, but a very important area to spend some time planning. Okay, let's try to get another one here. Um, see how much time we have. You mentioned three important questions uh, that we should have answers to. And one of those was the investment rate of return that we need to earn. Can you explain what you mean? Great question. So going back to, you may recall the example that we're referring to here. So the first thing I would get to is let's, let's use our example that we used earlier. We have two couples, couple A and couple B. Uh, let's say that they are both the same age. Uh, let's say that both couples are receiving the same social security benefits and both couples are have the same amount of money built up in their retirement bucket of investments. And let's just assume that that's $2 million, just for the heck of it. So couple A, let's say that couple A recently finished a lot of upgrades to their home. So they recently replaced their roof and they replaced a new kitchen and a new bathroom. Uh, let's say that they uh, buy cars maybe every 10 years. They really, they really don't enjoy doing uh, cars very much. So maybe once every 10 years. 
and then let's also say that they um, have no mortgage. Couple B, let's now assume that they do have a mortgage. Let's say that they have a mortgage because they had more children and they had a lot more college expenses and they use their home equity line of credit uh, to be able to do that. So they've got 300,000 of debt. Let's also say that they have a condo down in Florida uh, where they spent, where they'd like to spend winters. And let's say that they like cars. So they buy cars every three years, whereas couple A didn't do that. So clearly couple B spends a lot more money and it's gonna requ require a lot more money to support their lifestyle. So if it requires more money, that means that they're going to need to pull more money out of their retirement bucket of investments every month than couple A. So if both couples would like their money to last until, let's say, they're age 91 or 92 years old, couple, couple, a is going, couple B is going to have to earn a much greater investment rate of return on their investments in order for their retirement bucket to last longer, whereas couple A can, can get away with earning a much less rate of return. The key is understanding the rate of return that you must earn, that you need to earn, because you could either be investing too conservatively and have money run out too quickly, or you could be more aggressive than you need to be and subjecting yourself to more risk than is necessary. And why should you take more risk if you don't need it? This is why knowing that rate of return that you need to earn is so critically important. I mentioned it earlier, but in all these years, 35 years later, I have yet to meet one couple who knew the answer to that question without us calculating that out. So I strongly recommend spending some significant time figuring out not only how dependent you are over and above social security, pensions, and, uh, and rental property, if you have it, on your savings, but also more importantly, figuring out what that rate of return is that you need to earn in order to make your money last. Critically, critically important. Okay, so I think that we are up against the clock here. So if your specific question was not answered, uh, please add that into the survey uh, that is gonna pop up uh, at the end of this webinar. I wanna, I wanna sincerely thank you uh, for participating and stay, staying with us for, uh, for this entire webinar here today. We hope the information was help, helpful for you as you begin to prepare for and navigate your retirement transition. If, uh, if at any time you're looking for more information uh, about Savant, and what we do, I invite you to go to savantwealth.com uh, to learn more, or if you'd like to schedule that 15-minute call and you'd like to chat more, we are here. We'd like to answer your questions, and we'd like to help And if you want to give us that opportunity. So thanks again, and have a great day. If you enjoyed this webinar, visit savantwealth.com guides and download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources.